This podcast is a production of Open Pediatrics, a free online resource for health professionals' education. Visit openpediatrics.org for more. Welcome to the World Shared Practice Podcast. I am Dr. Jeff Burns, Chief of Critical Care at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. We are very pleased to have with us today, Dr. Martin Kniber. Dr. Kniber is the Chief of the Division of Pediatric Critical Care Medicine at the Beatrix Children's Hospital at the University Medical Center in Groningen, the Netherlands. Martin, welcome. Thank you, it's an honor to be here. Martin, it is not an exaggeration for me to say that you are one of the most prolific investigators in pediatric mechanical ventilation anywhere in the world today. And I read with great interest your editorial in the October 2021 issue of Pediatric Critical Care Medicine entitled Driving Pressure and Mechanical Power, the Return of Physiology in Pediatric Mechanical Ventilation. And I would urge all who care for critically ill children to read it. It is, I think, the most concise, comprehensive, lucid overview and description of the evolution of the thinking in the adult world on lung injury from mechanical ventilation and lung protective ventilation. And so to an overview of what we know to this moment about ventilator induced lung injury in children and what we do and do not know about lung protective ventilation in children. And so it's, Martin, I simply can't say enough about that editorial, but we are here today to also hear your thoughts on two studies that appeared in the October issue of Pediatric Critical Care Medicine. And that is a study by Diaz and colleagues from Latin America, Uruguay, and Chile. And they conducted a study entitled Driving Pressure and Normalized Energy Transmission Calculations in Mechanically Ventilated Children Without Lung Disease and Pediatric Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome. Could you take us through that study? And that's in part what your editorial was about. What question were they seeking to answer? And what were the salient features of their methodology and findings? Thank you for your really kind introduction. And well, the the, the DIA study, it's a really really nice study because it brings together the individual components of ventilator-induced lung injury, being volume trauma, the delivery of too large data volume, atelect trauma, giving uh, too low end expiratory lung volume, the biotrauma, the respiratory rate. And these, these individual components were proposed by Gattinoni based on the equation of motion to describe the individual contribution and how much energy is actually delivered to the lungs. And Amato did somewhat a little bit different where he used the so-called driving pressure, which is the ratio of tidal volume over respiratory system compliance and linked that with outcome. And although these concepts were developed in, in adults, and there are differences between children and adults. The, the basics of, of ventilation are more or less the same as what we, do, what we do in the adult world, what we do in the pediatric world. So the DIA study looked into these two new paradigms or these two concepts, whatever you want to call them, and how they would relate uh, in, to children and if they would relate to outcome. And they have their uh, database of mechanically ventilated patients with ARDS, according to our uh, Pediatric Acute Lung Injury Consensus Conference definition, and a group of children who underwent anesthesia, so with normal lungs. And they applied the mechanical power formula, which is the formula proposed by Catinoni to calculate the amount of energy that is being delivered to the respiratory system. And, and they calculated driving pressure. What they did based on what they were reading throughout and, and comments from others, they also normalized the mechanical power because two key components in that formula being tidal volume and respiratory rate are of course age dependent. So they modified the formula a little bit by normalizing tidal volume. And what they found in this this group of children was that the driving pressure was significantly higher between patients with pediatric ARDS and those without, so the anesthesia group. And they found that driving pressure better discriminated between the two groups than, for example, medical mechanical power, whether or not mechanical power was normalized or not. Uh, And then they further uh, alluded on the age dependency of the key components of mechanical power formula. But then the association with driving pressure and outcomes stayed the same. So this is one of the first reports on the true driving pressure as proposed from the adult world in the pediatric world. And what they then they subsequently did, and that was quite interesting, in the anesthesia group, they played with the level of PEEP in those patients uh, to see what the level of PEEP, how it would affect the mechanical power. Because in the mechanical power formula, 
and I would advise to read it. It's a nice paper by Gattinoni, but it uses the peak inspiratory pressure, the plateau pressure, the tidal volume, the respiratory rate, and PEEP. And they found that at low PEEP, so at ZEEP, mechanical power was lower than at a PEEP of five centimeters of water. And this would make sense a little bit because at PEEP five, you would expect that the lung is better aerated, better recruited, so the tidal volume will be larger. Hence, the uh, mechanical power will be a little bit higher. So they more or less showed in their paper well, the, the two phases of PEEP. So yes, PEEP is necessary for, for lung aeration, but on the other hand, it influences the calculations you do at the bedside. To go back to it just for a moment, as you're noting, the driving pressure is the uh, difference between the plateau pressure and the end expiratory pressure as set by the clinician. And you referenced the Amato study, uh, Marcelo Amato and colleagues, uh, 2015 New England Journal, their paper, Driving Pressure and Survival in the Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome. And they found that a driving pressure less than 15, almost regardless of any other variable, that that was the most significant variable that predicted outcomes in yep. adults. Now, the Diaz study, how do we link that to that finding? Does that give us any insight whether a driving pressure somewhere around the threshold of 15, 16, which is really where they found it. What, what, what do we take from this DI study and the Amato study? If anything, yeah. what can we infer? Yeah, that's, that, that's an interesting point. They found in their group that the, the driving pressure was around, well, let me see what the number is, about 13 in the parts group. So below the injurious threshold that was identified by Amato at all. So from the, the study by Diaz, we, we can, there's no dose-dependent relationship between the driving pressure and outcome. So we, we, we are still a bit in the dark from their study, what the clinical relevance would be. And this is something that we try to explore in our study, which we'll discuss a little bit later on. They just examined, okay, what would predict the difference? And the driving pressure better predicted the difference. But the clinical relevance needs to be explored. At least, at least in their group needs to be explored in further work. We cannot deduct that. And as you noted, and I believe as the authors noted, I believe only 10% of that, their study population had met official PARDS criteria. So obviously this was not designed or powered to really answer the question that I just put out there for you. But I just wanted to make it clear that yeah. it is interesting that they found, as you said, the threshold driving pressure of 13, but of course it's too small a sample and it wasn't designed to really study what Amato and colleagues found. Uh, the driving pressure of 15. Is that a fair summary? Yeah, that's a fair summary. And I think probably many people have read the Amato study, but Amato, they pulled data from a lot, lots of, I think, five or six randomized controlled trials. So they had a huge data set to make their calculations on. And that's something that, well, in Peach, we can only uh, hope to do so also as well. You gave a perfect summary of the DS study. Now, I wonder if we could transition to a study actually that came from your center and you were the senior author on it. And that as I said, also appears in the October 20 issue of Pediatric Critical Care Medicine, the October 20, 2021 issue. And that is uh, entitled, Driving Pressure is Associated with Outcome in Pediatric Acute Respiratory Failure. What question were you seeking to answer? Can you tell us a little bit about the salient features of the study design and, yeah. of course, your findings? We were inspired by Amato again when he gave his talk at the European Pediatric and Neonatal Ventilation Conference about driving pressure. And then our group decided, let's build a respiratory mechanics database and do uh, every morning we go by the bedside and we obtain clinical data and lung mechanic data from ventilated patients. And by doing so, we could build a, a sample size of, of, of over 200 children. And we wanted to study if driving pressure was related to outcome in our heterogeneous cohort of mechanically ventilated children. And we used data collected to calculate the energy uh, delivered to the lung which was in a, in a different paper. And the hypothesis was, of course, well, the higher the driving pressure, the lower uh, the ventilator free day, so the, the, the more worse the outcome. And the important thing is because we, as many other centers, use pressure control mainly as primary mode of ventilation, we had to do a manual inspiratory hold in our patients to obtain the plateau pressure to get the, uh, to get the calculations done. So our study included patients on day one and day two when they were uh, deeply sedated and or paralyzed. So there was no spontaneous breathing present in those patients. We calculated driving pressure according to the formula proposed by Amato. So the ratio of tidal volume over the respiratory system compliance. And we calculated the plateau minus PEEP because that's more easily accessible at the bedside. And we calculated the difference between the peak inspiratory pressure and the PEEP because some people 
uh, have proposed to substitute plateau pressure by peak inspiratory pressure to get an idea of the driving pressure. And although they refer to when you do that as a driving pressure, it's not really a driving pressure, it's more dynamic airway pressure. Because if you use peak inspiratory pressure, of course, you have the resistive properties of the respiratory system also playing a role. And then when we, well, we had the whole data set, and then we first studied the correlation between the Amato formula and plateau minus peak, excellent correlation. So if you're at the bedside, can have a plateau pressure and you use that to calculate the driving pressure, it gives a really good uh, impression of the driving pressure. The dynamic airway pressure gradient, so that peak inspiratory pressure minus peak seriously overestimated the actual driving pressure. So there is absolutely no means of uh, using that formula unless, but I wouldn't really advise it, if you take such a long inspiratory time that the flow has returned to zero before expiration starts but then the inspiratory time is way too long. So tidal volume over respiratory system complies or plateau minus PEEP gave similar numbers. And then we use the same statistical approach as Amato did. And that was a, a multi-level mediation analysis. So what you do is we created, of the whole group, we created three groups. One group that was matched for PEEP, one group that was matched for the driving pressure, and one group that was matched for the plateau pressure. And then all the other variables, they changed. Uh, so you have, uh, and then we made within these three groups, three subgroups, three samples. With so, so group one had a, a similar a peep and an increasing driver pressure and hence increasing plateau pressure. The other group had a, a similar driver pressure and uh, a difference in peep and plateau. And then the third group had similar plateau pressure and changes in peep and driver pressure. And then with the first group, so the ones with a who were matched for peep and had per stratum an increase in driving pressure and plateau pressure, that was significantly associated with a reduced ventilator free day at day 28. The other ones where we had a match them for driving pressure, we couldn't find that. And when we matched for plateau pressure, we couldn't find this as well. And I think the key mechanism in that is that we use too low PEEP. And that's something that we know from pediatric, pediatric uh, intensive units all over the world. We tend to use lower levels of PEEP and tolerate higher levels of FI2 uh, when the patients are getting more sick. So we could confirm, we could show a more or less similar observation as what Amato did. So the higher the driving pressure, the worse the outcome was at ventilator free days. Um, mortality numbers in our study were, were too low to draw any meaningful conclusions on mortality. But we could not, we could not show that Reducing driver pressure would be associated with a better outcome because of the, the uh, use of low levels of PEEP in our study. So to recap a little bit um, before we, we go on to your editorial and what does this all mean? Let me ask you this about your single center study that you've just been referring to. What are the next steps? Are there, is there enough intriguing data to make you think we should do a multi-center study to more carefully examine this? Or do you think that there is really still no signal there and, and moving on to a multi-center study to kind of validate a, a motto, as it were, is not the next step? I think indeed the first step would be to do a multi-center study and to see if our findings are validated. And that's different for some units. We also have a low threshold of putting patients on the oscillator. So maybe our lack of association in some points could also be directed that if the plateau pressure would increase, we would already have the patient on the oscillator. So I would, it would definitely call for a multi-centi study to, to see if our, uh, our findings hold true. And because it may also help us in trying to, a little bit to understand if it's driving pressure or mechanical power for the matter, if they are a driver of lung injury or if they are just a marker of severity. Because that's the big question that is open also in the adult world that nobody has answered yet. And they struggle in the adult world, they struggle with the same. They don't know that. And they don't have any randomized control trials, for example, showing that a driving pressure guided strategy or a mechanical power guided strategy would improve outcome versus the traditional use. So before we go on to on, on to those steps, I would yeah, I really would like to see if if the findings that we see, if they can be confirmed, if we do a larger multi-center study. And preferably with units coming from all over the world, because then we can really also account for the practice variability that we all have in, when we when it comes to mechanical ventilation. Can I ask you first, are you aware uh, whether there is a an ongoing trial in the adult world to test the hypothesis that targeting the driving pressure to improve outcomes? 
I don't know if such a study is currently going on. I know that there was a really small study that has been done, but it was just, I think, a proof of principle. I'm, I'm not aware of, of any studies currently being conducted in that way. And could I ask you, do you have specific plans yet? Uh, although maybe this podcast will be the impetus for this, but do you have specific plans underway to conduct an RCT to, again, look at, you tell me. I, I think it would probably be driving pressure over power, yeah. but you tell me. Is I think driving pressure would definitely be the, the, the one to go for first. No current plans yet, but always thinking of it. And perhaps when we can reconvene for the next police in, in San Diego. Tentatively, were you to test the hypothesis that driving pressure uh, and targeting and limiting driving pressure improves outcomes, what would you set the driving pressure at? Yeah, that's a fascinating question because we don't really know the true number and we don't know if the if the threshold of 15 that was identified in adults would also be applicable to our population. And this calls again back for this multicenter study to validate the findings and to see if we can identify a dose dependent relationship between driving pressure and outcome in children. Then we can find the true cutoffs. Terrific. So uh, if I could to recap it just a bit, as you've been saying and as our audience and listeners know, in the adult world, they rely on control variable of volume and flow. And so what we've been talking about is really the pressure time scaler. We're at the end of inspiration in the volume controlled mode. Inspiratory pause hold is um, activated, flow stops, and the delta between the peak pressure and the plateau pressure, as you've been noting, is the respiratory system resistance. And the plateau pressure and the delta between the plateau pressure and the end expiratory pressure is what we've been referring to as the driving pressure. And as you well noted, in pediatrics, we use principally a time cycle pressure limited mode where pressure is the control variable. And now I want to take you into your editorial because, first of all, you beautifully took us through what the adult evolved literature states. And then you had a really provocative comment about how we may have stumbled uncontrollably under the truth. <laughs> so, could I take us now to your editorial? And again, that's um, in the October 2021 issue of the Pediatric Critical Care Medicine. And your editorial is entitled Driving Pressure and Mechanical Power, the Return of Physiology in Pediatric Mechanical Ventilation. And so Martin, as we go through this, could I ask you first, and again, your distillation of, of the literature was so concise. I, I carefully read sentence after sentence and you each sentence said so much and it was building upon the next. And you were packing so much in that if you read it quickly, you were missing uh, so much of what you concisely put in there. But tell us again, connect for us first the concept of Gattinoni's baby lung and the, the desire to normalize, personalize as it were, finding the optimal driving pressure as, as a means of personalizing or normalizing the individual adult patient's respiratory system compliance to the amount of ventilation that they should receive. Can you explain that concept to us? Yeah, the, the, the baby lung concept by Catinoni, he proposed it many, many years already ago, simply saying that the, you shouldn't normalize tidal volume to body weight. What he examined in his, his lab and, and in animal work and then the data from patients for the respiratory system compliance, it is linear related to the amount of inflatable lung volume. So the lower the compliance, the sicker the lung, the stiffer the lung, the uh, lower the amount of inflatable uh, volume would be. And this would mean that, for example, if you have uh, a patient with a very a low amount of inflatable lung volume versus a patient with a sufficient amount of inflatable lung volume, if you would set a tidal volume at 6 ml per kg ideal body weight for both of these patients, the risk of over distension and the risk of injurious ventilation in the one with the low amount of inflatable lung volume would be bigger than in the one with the uh, sufficient amount of inflatable lung volume. And this is something that I more or less also uh, tested when I uh, was in 2012 in, in, in Toronto, where I did animal work and was found that if you would have a fixed tidal volume of 30 ml per kg, that in the, uh, some animals where the inflatable lung volume was larger, the injurious stimulus was lower. So there is a linear relationship. So to put it simply, 
the sicker the lung, the smaller the tidal volume you can safely put in your patient. And this, well, the, the concept of the driving pressure takes these two into account because on the one end of the equation, you have the tidal volume that you put in and on the other end, the compliance. So again, the lower the compliance, if you want to stay within a driving pressure below 15, then automatically the tidal volume needs to be lower because if you would keep your tidal volume fixed and the compliance is going down, then automatically the driving pressure is going up. So I think the driving pressure concept is a nice example of a easy clinical bedside uh, explanation of the baby lung concept. I was talking to the uh, the fellows the other day and um, you know explaining that just two decades ago, certainly three decades ago, you know we normalized values, we overdistended, and tried to recruit the st- these stiff lung units, and of course that just exacerbated the biotrauma, as Art Slutsky says, we were, we were inducing inflammation, we weren't resting the lung. And that this whole concept of um, the baby lung, as Gatnoni outlined it, is really, as you said, it's to normalize our ventilation so that we are ventilating those small, relatively heterogeneous, but now few lung units that are still somewhat compliant. And, not, and, and the goal is not to overdistend them, Yep. but to give kinder, gentler ventilation until the inflammation resolves. I mean, it's the bottom line. Uh, yep. Ride with the patient, give them enough time to resolve their inflammation, but don't exacerbate their inflammation. But now in the last third of the editorial, you very insightfully outlined, as I said, how perhaps in our predilection towards time cycle pressure limited with pressure as the control variable in pediatrics, that we've stumbled uncontrollably onto the truth. So take us through uh, what you were saying there. So the, this, this, well, maybe somewhat provocative statement I, I, I described, because well, originally we, we started to use a time cycle pressure limited mode of ventilation being pressure controlled mainly in pediatrics because of, well, in the early days we didn't have an attractive tube with cuffs, so we had lots of leakage and we couldn't really control the tidal volume on volume controlled modes of ventilation. That's why in pediatrics, I think there is a real preference for pressure controlled uh, ventilation. And with pressure controlled ventilation, the operator sets the inspiratory pressure that goes in the patient. So if you were to do nothing and would say, okay, I start with a patient, let's say on day one, on a, a inspiratory pressure of plus 20, and I wouldn't do nothing, would keep it on 20, then what you would observe is that if the patient improves over time, the tidal volume will automatically go up. And vice versa, if the patient would become more sick, the lungs would become more and more stiff, then the tidal volume would go down. And so I think with all the knowledge that we have, have gotten from the adults and, and people we put up in the pellet guidelines by saying, don't go up uh, beyond 28 centimeters of water in your inspiratory pressures, then we let more or less automatically dictate the patient the amount of tidal volume that goes in. And this probably also explains why in contrast with the adults, we found a relationship between a larger tidal volume and a better outcome, which would seem completely counterintuitive from the thinking that the lower the tidal volume, the better. But I think is that is because of the pressure controlled volume, because we set, if, uh, if we set a pressure, we don't exceed that pressure, and we let the lung compliance or the respiratory system compliance dictate how much volume actually goes in. Pressure limited uh, time cycle ventilation has been there all along to uh, save us from ourselves. Well, Martin, this has been a wonderful talk, but of course, the ultimate question here is coming right now, and that is, given all that you know, and given the strengths and limitations of the adult and pediatric literature in this domain, what is your optimal strategy for lung protective ventilation? Take us through where you start and then really kind of what you're monitoring and where you go. So we start in patients with any form of lung injury, we start with a pressure controlled mode of ventilation by setting the inspiratory pressure. And then we are monitoring, of course, the tidal volume, and we will make sure that the tidal volume does not exceed 8 ml per kg ideal body weight, because the physiologic tidal volume is somewhere between five and eight. So it doesn't make sense to go any higher. And then we monitor over time what happens with, with the tidal volume. And then if the patient improves, we titrate the pressures downwards to keep the tidal volume within that range. For PEEP, it's a little bit more difficult because we do not know what the best way to set PEEP is in pediatrics. Uh, we have a nice study with data from CHLA in Los Angeles and a CHOP of Philadelphia 
showing that patients who were off the low PEEP FI2 grid, ARZ network grid, had worse mortality, had higher mortality. So for PEEP setting, in the absence of any good recommendation for PEEP, uh, we adhere to the low PEEP FI2 ARDS network grid. And then we keep those patients on, on pressure controlled with, with those settings. As soon as the inspiratory pressures are going to exceed 28 because the lung is getting stiffer, and we see that the tidal volume is going to drop, let's say to three or four mL per kg, we put the patient on the high frequency uh, oscillatory ventilation. So just to put it briefly, pressure control motor ventilation, the limiting inspiratory pressure up to 28, monitoring tidal volume to be between five and eight mL per kg ideal body weight, and the PEEP setting according to the low PEEP FO2 ADOS network grid. And uh, we're unfortunately uh, running short on time, but you and Robbie Kamani and, and certainly many others have talked about how we sit there and we allow the SATs to uh, be very high and we're not paying enough attention to uh, FIO2. But could you take us through the lower limits of what you will accept in terms of pH and saturation? And do you also rely on any biomarkers here to guide uh, the lower limit of oxygen delivery and ventilation that you're willing to tolerate to get the child through this lung inflammatory process, regardless of its etiology? For the, the pH, we have a lower limit of about 720, 725. Sometimes we go a little bit lower, but I think this is what we also put in the PELIC recommendations. The upper limit of saturation is 97% in all patients. That's our dogma that's on the, on the wall of the unit. 97 is the new 100, and I think that's very important to, to adhere to. And uh, for the lower, if the, if, the, if the lung is really, if the space is really sick and has stiff lungs, then we accept a uh, saturation between 88 and 92% in the low range. And we have a, a liberal use of indwelling arterial lines, so we can monitor the, the lactate um, to see if there is no sign of increasing lactate. And we give a lot of patients, especially when they have lung injury, central venous line through the jugular vein and subclavian vein so that we can get some idea of the mixed venous saturation. So we have a patient, especially with moderate to severe or progression towards severe lung injury, we monitor not only the saturation and the pH, but we also monitor the, the lactate and the, the venous oxygenation. So for biomarkers, it's really fascinating and there's more and more data coming out, but I don't know if there's yet any one that as a golden bullet says, okay, this one you should monitor because if you follow this one and you stay within this specific thresholds, then you're fine. Well, that's probably hopefully something that will come out over the next few years. I know a lot of excellent work is being done on that. Well, uh, Dr. Martin Kniver, it's been a pleasure to have you here over the last 30 minutes. And for sure, we're going to have you back again with all of the work that you're doing. Best wishes with uh, completing the prospect trial. And for better or worse, the strategy that you just outlined is the same as we pursue for lung protective ventilation at Boston Children's Hospital. And we remain we also favor turning to the oscillator as uh, often as the last resort. As you know, from the work of John Arnold at Boston Children's Hospital, we find that it's still, we believe, a, a very useful tool despite its uh, outcomes uh, in adults. Nonetheless, Martin, thank you for all that you've done to help us better understand ventilator-induced lung injury and lung protective ventilation in the uh, pediatric critical care patient. Thank you very much. It was great talking to you. This has been a production of Open Pediatrics. Check out the description box to view the resources and journal articles referenced in this podcast. To hear more podcasts like this one, log on to openpediatrics.org.